Hello and welcome to Polycosm. My name is Christina and today we're finally doing some modular design for our Raven Shroud project. The modeling will be split into two parts. So in this video, I'll be taking you through modeling all of the modular assets. And in the next part, we'll model the rest of the assets that are more unique one-offs and also cover the unwrapping portion of the process. All right, let's get to it. So first of all, if you're unaware of what modular design is, I thought I'd explain it just a little bit. By definition, modular design is an approach for product designing, which is used to produce a complete product by integrating or combining smaller parts that are independent of each other. So if you've ever browsed around on, for example, Gumroad, ArtStation, Sketchfab, and so on, you've probably noticed some modular design sets or kitbash sets, whether that's a dungeon ruin set, a rural city kitbash set, or a hard surface kitbash set. What all of these sets have in common is that they're essentially small pieces that you can put together to build something completely new or something bigger. The reason modular design exists, especially in, for example, video game production, is to basically save on time. For example, instead of having to individually craft specific items like this table, you can create a library of 3D models to choose from, like different shaped planks, which you can size up however you want, and different types of legs, for example. With this simple set, you can create loads of different variations, and since they're all instances of each other, Instead of having to texture a whole 3D model, you can texture just the individual pieces and it will apply to all other areas where we've used this model. I actually put together a list of all the individual modular pieces I'd like to create and how they could be combined to create other new things. I also categorize them by materials, but of course you can do this however you want to. In the wooden category, I of course decided on different types of legs that could be used for tables, stools, and so on. And for planks, since they're so versatile, we can use them for tabletops, shelves, picture frames, bookshelves, chests, dummies, and so on. When you start creating modular sets, it's integral that the pieces are all sized correctly. So when put together, you don't have to do tons of scaling. To help with my scale, I brought in the 3D dummy I used when blocking out the room. I also copied over the table to get an idea of how big, long and thick the planks and table legs should be. Since I knew I wanted a few leg variations, I decided to duplicate the base once the size was right and just get cracking on with some designs. Now, I'm not a furniture designer or even a really good 3D modeler, I kind of just went for it. But if you ever feel stuck in any way, look up references. What we see in our head is so limited and probably less unique than we'd like to think. So by looking outwards, we'll stumble upon designs we never would have thought about. And that's really the key to good and unique designs. I should have actually followed my own example or my own advice because I ended up with some hideous designs sometimes. So I just deleted them and started over. But that's okay too, you know, it's, it's a process. For some of the designs, I tried to duplicate and change around some things to create a completely different look. And that's actually another key point I wanted to mention. Just keep it simple and low poly. Especially if you're going to be dealing with unwrapping, which I am later on. Keeping things low poly and simple allows for way more flexibility later down the pipeline if things need to be changed. Also, unwrapping a low poly model is going to be so much easier too, and I want to make the texturing part as seamless and fun for Omerjan as I can. The process for the planks is actually pretty straightforward. Although Omerjan's texturing will take care of most of the details, adding a few notches and planar shifts can make them seem a bit more three-dimensional. And of course, once they're done, I put them to the test by creating a prototype door out of just the planks. And like I mentioned earlier, I used instances for this. Now the benefit of instancing, which you can do with Alt-D instead of Control-D, is that they're all tied together. So if you decide to edit one, you basically edit all of them. If you're texturing one, you texture all of them. If you've accidentally pressed Control-D and noticed that like way later, what you can do is choose all of the parts you want replaced and then the original mesh last while still holding shift, and then hit Control-L for links, and then object data, 
or you can go through object, make links and object data. You'll know that your object is an instance if you have a number beside it under object properties. So for example, all of the planks that have this as its instance will have a 12 next to it. With all of that covered, I'll pause for a little time lapse. For the torch wall mounts, I found this brilliant concept art for the game Rust, but it unfortunately didn't list the artist's name. So I based my wall mount on these and did some slight modifications. I also used my beloved booleans, which if you didn't know, you can use by selecting your boolean shape first, then shift selecting your target mesh. Then with control numpad minus, you can cut a hole through your mesh. This is so handy for modeling more complex shapes. And if you want to confirm that change, select your target mesh and in the modifier tab, you can apply it and then just delete the Boolean if you want. In some areas of my meshes, I wanted to add just a bit more curvature to the harder planar shifts. So to do that, you select your edge and with control B for bevel, you can scroll up and down to kind of add a bit more dimension. But remember, the more low poly, the better. Plus, you can always right click and hit shade smooth. And what that actually does is smooth surfaces. And if you want to retain hard surfaces, you can hit the auto smooth under the normals panel in object data properties and just choose the degree in which you want to smooth. I also decided to create some easy bolts, which I will literally instance copy around everywhere in the scene, whether it's bolts for the chest, for metal wall mounts, ladders, and so on. I'm going to time lapse the footage a bit more, but if you want to skip ahead, just feel free to do so. Now, if you notice that the shading or color suddenly seems off, you've probably managed to flip the normals. If that happens, no biggie. Just make sure by toggling on face orientation under the overlays panel and by highlighting the red parts of your mesh in edit mode, which might mean all of it, head to mesh, normals and flip, or just hit alt N instead. Okay, so this is a little trick I think is super handy when designing more complex shapes. You can shift A, add in a single vertice under mesh, and what that does is, yep, you guessed it, give you a single vertice. Now, if you extrude it in edit mode and create a complex shape, you can later turn that into a curve, like I did with this wall lamp holder by going to object, convert to, and curve, and just adding thickness and depth under the bevel menu in object data properties. This is also how I created the pipes, for example, and later on the chains. Or you can just select everything and extrude it to make a pretty unique shape. That's exactly what I did with these shelf supporters. And I just threw on a subdivision modifier to kind of smooth out the curves and finally a solidify modifier to add a bit more dimension. 
As I'm doing all of the modeling, keep note that I'm trying to be organized by organizing everything into folders like I did when I wrote up that document in the beginning of the video. That way I can easily right click and select things instead of manually shift selecting everything. And the reason I'm not control J joining assets is because I want to easily be able to pick apart things and I want the individual pieces to remain an instance for texturing purposes later on. So once we've textured everything, I'll start joining meshes to kind of make the exporting process a lot easier. But for now, we're kind of leaving everything as like loose parts. Here you'll see me start to combine meshes together to create new things like a shelf and later on a table. Even though the assets are instances, you can scale, rotate and size them however much you want, as long as you're doing it outside of edit mode. If you do it in edit mode, you'll change every other instance as well. Note that if you stretch it too much, the textures will get stretched too and it just won't look as nice. If you really need it stretched though, you can just create a single copy of that asset by pressing the number I mentioned earlier and then you'd basically just retexture it or adjust the textures for the new model. This will no longer be an instance and will not be tied to any other model in the scene. As for the chains, if you're interested in how I created those, I highly recommend following JNM's tutorial covering all of this. He explains it much better than I do. For the floors, I wanted to add just a bit more dimension, so while staying in edit mode, I copied around the floor tiles to create a sort of tileable model. To make it easily tileable, I just made a perfect square. That way you can just slot them next to each other and they'll just fit. Because it's all just one model now, I'll only need one texture map to texture the entire floor. And later on, I just actually instance those very same tiles to create the walls, as they'll probably all just be the same in the end. And of course, for the diagonal walls, I just created a little wedge shape to kind of fit into the gaps of the sides. Then, by Shift D duplicating the walls to create a completely separate mesh, I modified it to make a pillar. That way Omerjohn can hopefully still use the textures from the wall but just slightly modify them to make it fit the pillar instead. As for the diagonal wall pillar, I actually just stacked a few blocks on top of each other and used a simple deform modifier to bend the shape and make it a bit more cylindrical. I mean, it didn't look amazing in the end, but it certainly did its job I think. Plus the texturing will probably make it look a lot better. Alright, time for some more time lapsing. Alright, for the floor with the trap in the middle, I just used a simple boolean to cut out a little shape. So the bit in the middle will probably just drop down or go to one side, leading the intruder to his or her death. I wasn't sure if this was the shape I wanted to go for in the end, so I just created a copy without really applying the modifier, just in case I needed to kind of change the shape later on. And I'm pretty much nearing the end now. I just wanted to put together some last minute things like a chest and some frames, but otherwise that's about it. There were a few things on the list like carvings and such, but I wasn't quite sure how to approach that in a low poly manner. I can use the knife tool and sort of cut out the shape or perhaps the quick shape add-on, but I didn't really have time or the patience for that sort of intricate work. 
but maybe I'll cover that in the next part when I model everything else. <laughs> Otherwise, that's all of it. It may not look like much, but trust me, this is the basis of so much. You can create all sorts of objects, furniture, and so on with just this simple little set. Once I've modeled all of the rest and Omerjohn's textured all of the assets, we'll provide this asset pack as a paid product via Gumroad and ArtStation. And of course, later on in the series, we're going to import all of these into Unreal and finally create our little Raven Shroud Thieves Guild environment. Oh, that was a lot. <laughs> and to think that I wanted to do the rest of the modeling and unwrapping all in the same video. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry for another late release, I just knew modeling everything was going to kick my ass, and it did. And no, I'm not going to blame Ripley again. <laughs> I'm actually thinking of adding the most recent Ripley photo at the end of each video. What do you guys think? I mean, how can you not want to see her adorable face? <laughs> Alright, thanks so much for watching guys. Bye! So when put together, you won't have to do- Oh my god, Ripley!